Hello and welcome to the Sanctuary, a safe space to speak from the heart. I'm your host, Israel, and my guest today is designer, fashion, model, uh, and you've also actually done like bodybuilding competitions too, and now writer, director of the film coming out soon, Made. Thanks for coming to the Sanctuary today, Melanie. Melani. Melani. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks so much for going to the sanctuary thank Milani. you israel yeah how are you doing today uh you're making me nervous right now but <laughs> <laughs> actually it's a beautiful day outside and i'm gonna apologize ahead of time because i didn't realize uh, they're fixing our generator today. So the dog might be barking. Koa, everybody knows Koa. So he'll be barking and saying hello in the background. But it's a oh, beautiful... Generator? Yes. Um, because we quite often here on the ocean, uh, we get uh, wi high winds. And so we lose our power a lot. So we need to have... Um, oh. Yeah. So when we purchased this place, actually, it already had um you know a propane uh tank like a generator to keep at least the fridge and the stove um and the television <laughs> for the children <laughs> on yeah the wi-fi right because wi-fi that's it yeah. it goes down that's it we're done <laughs> no but like uh internet is uh is uh, what is is it right now like you know you you have a right to have access to good internet yes oh yeah because like pretty much everything happens online um so i don't know which one i want to start with but let's start with the rugs yes. yeah how did you how did that begin so basically um you know my background is fashion design and i'm gonna tell you a cute little story of how my husband and i met he actually mm -hmm. um, heard about me through a mutual friend and uh, actually asked me to uh, do a presentation, an event for, because he is in the flooring business and he often does presentation mm -hmm. um, to sell, you know, at the time he was selling sheets of vinyl flooring. It is not sexy. Okay. Sheets of vinyl flooring. How do you make that <laughs> sexy? And of course he knew I was, you know, doing my runway shows in Halifax. I kind of started doing it with, you know, reflections at the time, you know, with Smirnoff. You know, we did like mini fashion shows with uh, AIDS Coalition, you know, Mana for Health and all that stuff. And so he kind of mm -hmm. heard about me and then he's like, you know, can I hire you? to do this presentation and so i got my girls involved and uh fashion we did you know ladies going on the runway with flooring going down the runway with these vinyls oh, yeah dur nice. exactly during a selling uh thing so basically they're like yeah i like that sheet of vinyl and and so he said it was the most successful um, sales he had in sheet and vinyl flooring. <laughs> and so I was hired pretty much for life. <laughs> so of course he wooed me and stalked me a little bit. And I was like, no, I'm not ready. <laughs> um, but then, you know, long story short, um, you know, we're in business, we work together, uh, we're self-employed. So he's in the flooring business. So fashion, we just kind of married that together. We moved to Toronto together, mm -hmm. and then he was headhunted for a company in Vancouver, and then for a huge luxury wool carpet business, and then left mm. that um, after uh, successfully uh, making that happen uh, for seven years. Then he broke away, and then we started our own agency, and that's when I did mm -hmm. the start starting the the rugs ourselves. So we. I do a collection of Mikizo designs, um, and then that is sold through uh, luxury flooring uh, stores across Canada. But of course, that's not happening right now. But we do yeah. we we do sell them through uh, designers. So uh, if you are an interior designer or an architect, we work with them closely um, across North America, mm. Hawaii. You know, uh, you know where there's there's lo lots of people who can afford 
expensive rugs. <laughs> like, you know, the hospitality, mm-hmm. the condos, the hotels, that's who, who would hire me to, to do the design. Yeah. Mm. And how do you come up with these designs? So the designs are very organic um, because I'm quite, uh, I love my indigenous roots. Uh, I really love uh, these uh, tribal designs. And so basically I look into nature for texture. I love photographing Mm. animals. Uh, So sometimes, yeah. Ah. So the prints come from, um, we used to have a, a second home in Hawaii. So I was exposed to a lot of nature. We took, you know, while the kids were napping, I would take photos of, you know, their uh, natural habitat. Uh, So lots of animals and, you know, marine life and seaweed and we dive. So lots of underground photos of seaweed and, you know, all that stuff. (laughs) <laughs> like I, I did this one rug. Uh, it was, it was actually one of my best sellers. It's the the natural mm. pigeon uh, that they have in, um, I guess their, I don't know, official pigeon in Hawaii. And one, this one pigeon had so many textures just on one wing. It had different wow. patterns all over. It was unreal. So Mm -hmm. then I was painstakingly taking photos really close in a zoo, you know, and I was like, oh my God, Mm. don't move. And when it, and then it opened its (laughs) wings and then all this was all different too, different colors. And Mm. so then I used that. Um, and then we send it the rendering to our, um, cute little village in Nepal, Kathmandu. And then, uh, that's that's when mm. where it happens and they hand knot it wow. so per square inch uh it's up to from 60 to 120 knots depending if you use wool s- use silk or wow. wool or yeah and i only use that's super <laughs> intricate yes. eh? and so we we use only natural products um like my designs mm-hmm. yeah my designs anyway yeah mm 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 um okay so that's a carpet but the fashion thing came before that yes. how did fashion start for you and how's that journey been so far? uh the fashion i think i mean if if you ask anybody like i guess in high school or even i was a tiny little thing i've always loved it loved textures uh, I spent a lot of time by myself because I'm the sixth child and I was always kind of left oh. alone, you know, with the nanny and she's like, keep busy outside in nature. So I would be outside, you know, I was very curious with little insects and bugs. And of course, living in the Philippines are quite tropical, beautiful textures mm-hmm. and colors. And I really already loved um, different uh, colors and nature, even, even if it was a rust on a leaf, you know, I was very curious, why is there a rust on the leaf? Like what fungus is on that or mushrooms or I was already very interested in that. Um, and then, yeah, I just, I don't know what it is. And then of course, growing up, you know, my mother was quite a socialite. Um, she, you know, my father, um, worked for the U.S. Navy. And so she had, you know, money to do her nails and her, you know, fashion, her shoes and her little bags. And I think really that's where it came from in watching her. Like I was this tiny little thing and, you know, and I was just looking up and just so enthralled and she loved reading, reading magazines and Mm. fashion. And so at a very young age, I was really trained to look at that, you know, and, Mm. um, yeah, I think that's where the love came. And then, you know, came to Canada. And of course the first thing, my mother wants me to do is go to medical school or <laughs> it's like, no, you know, like she's like, I think you're a really good psychologist because you're really good at analyzing people. And I'm like, what? I can't sit in the mm. one in an office and listen to your problems all day. Like I can't do that. <laughs> so unbeknownst to her, I mean, she knew I got accepted at Dow and then 
unbeknownst to her, I applied to Collège La Salle in Montreal. And I had to send in a portfolio. And I'm not the best, like, illustrator, you know, but I love to paint and all that stuff. But you had to send in all the mm. stuff, a portrait and da-da-da. So then I did all that. And then I got accepted. And uh, yes, oh, wow. and she didn't know, um, but I applied for a student loan. I took a year off after high school, or my friends and I did. And then we basically uh, saved up all the money. I had like five jobs. I worked at the VG. I managed a boot tree, you know, like a, a like cowboy boots. That was really bad, you know, in back then. And, and uh, I did so many jobs and I helped my my mother, um, you know, take care of the elderly. I did so many things, saved up money, got a student loan. And then I'm like, mama, I'm going for it to school in Montreal. <laughs> Why? <laughs> She's like, how was our reaction to that? She didn't speak to me for two years. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. How, how, how was that for you though? Um, I was actually felt very free. I laughed. I I remember. I don't know if I can say this on 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 your podcast. Like, are we allowed to swear here or do say? Oh yes, my! Are, oh, 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 awesome. Okay. All right. <laughs> so anyway, I laughed and I coordinated with the school because I didn't know anybody in Montreal, and I said I need a living space. I need this and that, and so they got me this little apartment. Um, above a sex shop and <laughs> on St. Catherine, St. Catherine in, Mo in Montreal. And I, I remember getting there and I was like, I'm really afraid. And I couldn't call my mom. I couldn't call anybody. And I was like, what, what's going to happen to me here? You know? And <laughs> it was this tiny little thing. Like you basically walked in and there was this, the kitchen, the bed, and then the bathroom, like all in two, Oh my God! <laughs> two like two hundred square feet, but my yeah. landlady said, "But you have the rooftop." So I had the all. Uh... Yeah, so I had an outdoor patio above the suck shop, <laughs> and I had the, <laughs> this whole patio. And I was like, "I'm gonna make friends in Montreal because I'm gonna party <laughs> on the rooftop," and that's what yeah, I did. Yeah. But I was so happy to be free and transition into living alone. You know, I was 19. No, I was I was 20 by then, actually, because I took a year off on on my 19th and my 20th. I moved um, in. Mm. Yeah, in August. But the wonderful thing is that my sister uh, who immigrated here a few years before, um, she got accepted for her bachelor's degree in McGill. So oh. it, it was in Point Claire, it was an hour away from Montreal, but we were mm. together. I had my sister, it was me, even though we were an hour apart, she could, we could spend mm. weekends together. And we, it was really mm. seriously, my husband hates it when I say it, but I said it was one of the best times of my life. Seriously, I Why? was free, you know, I cooked my own food, I shopped my own food, I learned to speak a different language, you know, oh, oh I just, uh, I loved, you know, going to the Depaneur and, you know, oh, and you, you could purchase alcohol, like, right in the grocery store. I love that, right? <laughs> right? Oh my God, that was the best. And, you know, you, and I didn't have... I had money, enough money for school and shoes, but I didn't have money. For <laughs> but I, didn't, I didn't have money for food. So I budgeted my food, like lots of ramen that my, uh, my elder yeah. sister sent to me and my brothers mm. in, you know, they worked at a, a meat company, send me chicken. You know, I had that <laughs> to budget that and I had a dollar. A dollar for lunch. <laughs> yes. 99. Oh do you remember? <laughs> do you remember the 99 cent Wendy's burger? 
Yes, yeah. but I couldn't even really eat meat at the time. It was too expensive. It was just a fish one or something, and nine <laughs> and ninety nine cent falafel and ninety nine cent pizza. I mean, I was that's okay. living, man. That's living. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> we have to talk about the shoes, right? <laughs> like, what were shoes more important than food? Let's talk about this, we're in, Milani. What, why? We're in fashion. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't afford, I didn't have, like, I was always a thrift shopper. So I, you know, I would buy the clothes, thrift shopping, and then I would revamp the, vamp them. And so they were a new design, mm -hmm. but they were old, you know, mm -hmm. they were faded. And I couldn't afford those Montreal kids. They had money. Like, they had Prada and then, you know, all the stuff, like Hugo Boss, Chanel. Like, you know, it was crazy, but I would make it my own. But I knew something I couldn't make was shoes. And I, I was like, I'm going to Browns and I'm getting that $300 shoes and I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to eat this month. <laughs> See, you got to think about these things. <laughs> um, how, so how was it your experience in that school? I loved it. It was the best time, really. Um, I heard now it's not the same. But when we were going mm. to school around 93, um, we were taught by actual skilled artisans. We were um, taught by uh, fashion designers themselves. Um, mm. I remember this German lady who taught us about textiles and I loved her. She was so strict. But she, man, I know, like, I know that you're wearing cotton poly. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, she was so amazing, <laughs> you know? And my, and I actually did two um, uh, certificates because I left the women's wear and I did men's wear. So I did draping um, and women were very catty and I couldn't handle it. You know, with so much competition, really, like young ladies, and so I'm like, I'm going, I'm going to menswear. And then I go to menswear, and it was tons of women. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> oh my god. But tailoring is more architecture. You know, you're, you know, you're not doing draping on a mannequin. You know, you're not draping your muslin. Mm. You're, you know, basically uh, measuring the person, and then drafting it and then making a pattern and then making a suit so i have training in both mm. women's and men's wear so yeah i love that um, <laughs> what, what did but, you do what did you yeah what what did you do once you were done with the school so then i uh work for uh chabanel uh after because they pair you with a company. So I worked in Chabanel for, uh, I think only a few months. And then, mm. um, a lot of personal things happened because I was married to a different person back then. Um, and it, you were my right out right after school. No, I got married like a year later. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. so my ex came from Nova Scotia and joined me in Nova uh, in Montreal, and then he's from Dominica. Uh, his 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 father is from Nova Scotia, and the mother is from Dominica in the West Indies, Trinidad, you know, mm -hmm. Dominica that area. And uh, we ended up going there uh, for five weeks during winter, and decided to get married there, and came back. And then uh, he went back to Halifax, and then I went back to school because uh, we had a, mm. a, a business. Uh, we had a wood chips business. Uh, we're very entrepreneurial, so we always mm. wanted to be self-employed. So even then, even then, my ex, I, you know, he's a beautiful artist, but I said to him, you know, we need to have a business, and this is what we need to do. So. So actually, I know a lot of people from there because the wood chips we used to supply. Uh, it's bedding for animals. So we supplied Bengal mm. Lancers all the way to the valley. Everyone who owned horses, um, everybody oh. who had um, poultry, you know, like the mass pr mm -hmm. production of poultry. Um, yeah, yeah, that's when I found out that we were eating chicken. That was like 30 days turnover. I was like, oh, wow. I was like, 
I was like, what? Yeah, it was really crazy, crazy time. Mm. But um, yeah, personal things happened and a lot of things happened. And I ended up coming back uh, here uh, in the valley because I grew up in the valley. When we first immigrated, uh, we I grew up in Gasparo, Wolfville. So, yeah, mm. and then a, a lot more things happened. And then I left the guy and I said, hey, I'm going to the Philippines for six months to find myself. So by 23, 23, 24, I left. I went to the Philippines for six months to find my roots and find myself again. I was really... Was that your first visit to the Philippines? Since I immigrated, yes. So I was away for 11 years before... I went home and my brother said, you, you won't last two weeks. <laughs> That's what he said. Were they right? No, I was there for six months, the full six months, wow. because uh, I had a Canadian passport. Um, you could, you're only allowed to stay there for six months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then a lot more things. How was that experience? I loved it. Loved every second of it. I actually mm. went home because I joined a multi-level marketing called Amway. Do you remember Amway? Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. So we opened that in the Philippines, and I was hired to translate because I spoke both languages. So I, ha I got mm. paid, and I also sold. So um, mm -hmm. it was a very exciting time for me. I met a lot of people. You know, I ended up singing my national anthem out loud in front of 5,000 people. And then I forgot the words. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was bad. And then they sang with me. The people sang with me. You know, it was... <laughs> and that, that, oh that, I had so many experiences. Like, we could talk for five hours, seriously. <laughs> but the most Kodak moment of my life is I had this huge um, board that I carried that was bigger than me. And I had my tripod and I had a camera. And literally, if you saw me, it was hilarious. Picture me in a rice field where it's full of mud. I have my shoes off and I'm walking in between those little mud paddies in between the rice field. Mm. And I had that carry cool. because I was doing presentation to a bunch of farmers who couldn't. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I was oh I was invited there by my uncle, who's quite ambitious. He's yeah. like, oh, if you do this and this, and I will have my people and da da da. And of course, they couldn't afford two thousand pesos. Yeah. But you know, I had I helped my you know a few of my my family, and then I purchased stuff for them so that they could distribute the products. Um, but man, mm. it was, I mean, it was amazing trying to explain to them, you know, in my language and I hadn't been home for mm. 11 years and man, it came back, it all came back, but it was so hard because, um, when you're speaking to the farmers, they speak the true Tagalog, the true Filipino. And I only knew the slang. So. <laughs> Mm. But I learned so much. I traveled all around uh, the Philippines, where my mother was from, where my father was from, um, where I grew up. I, I learned so, so mm. much in six months. So much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you, you came back after your visa, like, you know, yeah. after the yes. six months. Did you get right into fashion once you came back? Um. A lot of things happened. Uh, I met around that time. Actually, I started working at, it used to be ASAP, but now it's called Mabuhay. Um, I don't know. It's a Filipino restaurant on uh, Argyle there. I don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. it, but it used to be ASAP. So then I came back. I needed a job. Uh, so then I asked them, I said, you like, you don't even have to pay me, but I need food. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this, you know, little apartment, uh, where tons university students lived. It was like a one bedroom. And then we shared, um, you know, like communal 
spaces and bathrooms and stuff. I lived in there for like, I think $69, like mm. bi-weekly or something. And then uh, I worked there. I worked at uh, uh, Goody Baskets at the time owned by two beautiful men and taught me about, you know, everything like I know about florals and making a beautiful basket and <laughs> I learned so much from them. And then, uh, mm. then when I had enough money saved up, I bought a sewing machine, a commercial so sewing machine. And then, um, because the one room didn't, uh, fit a studio, I rented another studio and it's the CN building, you know, across Barrington there. I had, a, I mm. shared it with a bike guy in the basement and uh, and then later on I saved up more money and then I had an apartment right in mm. the C CN director's uh, quarters. I had a beautiful oh, apartment. Nice. It had Wayne Scotting all around and um, I made a deal with the, with the, the landlord and you know, I, it was, I, I did a lot. Like I sold Zen gardens, uh, to plovers. I did everything I could. I had three other jobs, uh, to make a go at fashion. Um, I joined, uh, my girlfriend was a part of Shakespeare by the sea that she got me on the board. Um, a lot of things happened. And, um, then I met Richard, you know, f a few years later, I met Richard mm -hmm. and then, uh, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you remember your first fashion show? Uh, I did. You mean like I that I showed? So the yeah. sh in in Kalash Lasal, if when you graduate, you have to have your fashion show, or you can't graduate. Ah, yeah. So that was the gotcha, that was the gotcha. very first fashion show. But one one out out of school. Out of school was um, I did one in. It was for, I think, Amanda for Health, and it was for women who were incarcerated. And it was like, we called it A to Z, A to Z fashion show. Um, and it was a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And it was at, uh, what is that building now? It, Marquee. Do, do you remember Marquee? So is it still there? Yeah. I'm not sure, but I don't, I think they have a different, yeah, it's now, a different, yeah, it used to be, they had a basement and I, you know, they gave it, we knew somebody and we rented that and basically we did a fundraiser. I didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. I had enough, I had enough money to, <clears throat> to pay everybody the music and the stuff. And then the fundraiser, I saved up money and gave them, but we did an awareness thing. So. Yeah, mm. but uh, mm. a lot. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned earlier on you did something with Smirnoff. How did that come about? I have no idea. I think I met somebody through Jonathan Bond was another place I worked at, and I don't know how through the grapevine they wanted a bunch of designers, um, and I was like the only one like twenty years ago who was like designing, so they asked me to ask other designers and I, you know, I, there was no other designer. So I, I met a girl from Tunz university and just through the grapevine, I, I met a bunch of uh, designers and we did a collection together. I wish I could have, mm. I could show you the video, but, but that's when I met Sandrella, you know, cause I went to high school. Yeah with Sandrella and one day I was like I had these beautiful like dress like it was like a curtain dress but it was like this big and Sandrella was walking down the street and I was like Sandrella from high school I was like you will fit in this dress it's a beautiful you know that beautiful curly hair it was gorgeous and I said yeah. like, you will fit in this dress and you're gonna walk in the runway and she's like I've never done it before. <laughs> like, okay. And yeah. So Sandrella, like not modeled for me. You have to ask her to go on your podcast because she has, she has many <laughs> stories. <laughs> so, um, mentioning Sandrella, you also talked about, uh, like 
you had a foreign bodybuilder. Oh yes. So I just for people to know, Sandrella is my producer for the film made for film five. Mm -hmm. So um the bodybuilding. So then of course after this we went away. Like we were Richard and I went away to Toronto for five years and we went to Vancouver for twelve years, had the children, you know, um in Vancouver and we came back um we purchased this cottage here and we had every intention of going back to Vancouver and I'm so glad mm -hmm. we didn't uh, I was going through mm -hmm. a major depression my mother passed on and I just didn't want to go back and deal with my family in Vancouver I was very hurt um so I'm like let's stay here and just to you know, I walk, I was walking on the beach, you know, picking some sea glass. And I was like, really, I couldn't get over so many issues. And so I like, I was like, somebody said, you know, you should work out. And I'm like, yes, I'm going to work out and I'm going to join a bikini competition. <laughs> <laughs> you never go the easy road like I'm gonna do everything. And I said, yeah, I'm like, I always wanted to do it. Uh, but it mm. was not a very feminine thing to do. You know, I did martial <clears throat> arts, I did volleyball, you know, but to be a bodybuilder and to work out with weights, I'd never done it. Like I work out, you know, that, you know, like aerobics and stuff, but never weights. And, mm. um, and my mother would not have approved anyway, but because she was gone, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it all. I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to shave my head. So I <laughs> shaved my head and yeah, what? like a after the competition, I did that, but I was just, yeah. um, yeah, I, I said, I really want to do it. So I got a, I went to good life and <laughs> I'm plugging good life, but I found, I met, I met <laughs> one of my really good friends now, Krista Corcoran, and she trained me. Um, and in eight months I competed in a one third place. Yeah. That's yeah. Dream. So that is crazy. Yeah. Cause the amount of work that goes into that, I watch a documentary and I'm just like, Nope, that I will never yes. try that. I love my food too much. <laughs> yeah. I... But you, you know, you mentioned Sandrella and you mentioned she's your producer. So I think it's a good time now to talk about me. Yes. Uh, also, how, sorry. Do you, how do you also, also yeah? I forgot that's how I saw Sandrella because she was also doing she had done bikini competitions and I saw her at the gym and so we got reconnected so I just want to mm. mention that yeah yeah <laughs> um so one one thing um how did you like, did you ever want to make film? I know you've always taken photos, but was film ever something you wanted to do? I always had a video camera. Always. Oh. All my cameras had little videos. And I have I have footage uh, since the children were born uh, because I wanted to document their life because... Mm. Uh, my life was never documented. I had a couple of photos growing up and I always said when I have children, uh, they're going to be documented from the day they were born. And Kilana's first <laughs> appearance is her coming out of my stomach. <laughs> she was on film, man, like on film. Yes. Wow. And then after that, they actually, you do, you're not allowed to film anymore. Um, I remember, oh, yeah, you can't film the birth anymore. It's not, yeah, oh, it's, okay. that's in Vancouver. I don't know in, in Halifax, but you're no longer allowed to, unless you have birth at home, oh. I guess, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. So that's always been a thing, but like, there's a difference between mm -hmm. documenting and actually doing something narrative. Was that also something you wanted to do? The really, I'm more interested in documentaries, um, but mm. because Film Five didn't allow documentaries, I was kind of that's why I was telling you I was humming and hawing about like, do I, I have to do a script? <laughs> like, how can I do this? And then, you know, like, and I had ten days. I had like, I, I think you mm. were in that 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 uh, 
ori- yeah, yeah, orientation. Was, was, was. And uh, I was, yeah. I had no script. Like when I, <laughs> 10 days before it was submitted. And I was like, mm. Ian's like, yeah, you should do it. I'm like, yeah. Because he, kn- he knew me from film <laughs> one. And mm. then uh, I was like, okay. Uh, so it was the weekend. I was cleaning the cottage. Uh, so we Airbnb cottage. And then they had just, there was like a party there. I, which I don't allow parties, mm-hmm. but I was here. I was like just complaining about the mess in the bathroom because parties mm-hmm. come with awful things. And I don't know what happened in the bathroom, but I was like basically crying, feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> and I was like mm-hmm. cleaning the toilet. And then I just remembered my mom reading my mom's diary um, because we were able to clean the nursing home and their stuff and paraphernalia from the nursing home. And I took like some of the diaries and I read, you know, around the same time we were living in Halifax that, mm. you know, you know, I told you she was like a socialite. She had a beautiful life in the Philippines and to come here yeah. with nothing. And, uh, I think also she was probably going through some major isolation, you know, depression Mm. and the cold, the weather, the language. And so she said, she wrote down that she was on top of the building and she was thinking of, you know, ending her life because she couldn't believe that she was cleaning toilets um, mm. and then in the end she said, but it's worth it because I still have a little girl to, you know, to look after. And that was me. So anyway, that really hit a home. And then I just like dug some scraps of paper and I sat on the dining table and I, I wrote made like basically in 20 minutes, I like had the narrative and I was like it you know it has to be this person that represented like Lena had to represent all things I felt and then all the things she felt so I'm so I'm sorry I'm getting so emotional no 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 this is this is really what the sanctuary is about is again a safe space to speak from the heart so we have all the time uh we could we can take all the time you need so anyway um anyway thank you so much israel for giving me a voice so um anyway the 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 main story isn't you know it it isn't just about a migrant worker you know it's it's really about all of us especially now during the pandemic you know feeling the isolation Um, that you do when you're living by yourself. Maybe you don't have a family, you know, um, you're by yourself and you're feeling isolated and you can't talk to somebody, you can't hug somebody, Um, you know. And like, I wanted to portray, you know, Lena's longing for her child back home. And I also wanted to portray how, you know, she was so poor and then, you know, just coming from that third world country. And then she lives with this guy. She's looking after this boy, Jay. Um, But he has a beautiful home and a beautiful facade and and goes to a private school. And yet he's also feeling isolated. He He needs connection. He needs, you know, love and affection like all of us do. And, you know, I didn't want to obviously make it about a pandemic, but I wanted to make it about isolation and depression. And because I think my mother, you know, she was very harsh. She was a, you know, I love her dearly and I love every sacrifice she made. But, you know, she was not a soft person. She was a hard person. Uh, she had six children to raise and we all had to survive. And not just that, like we, I worked, I mean, I came here around 12 and I started working at 13 
and I never stopped. Mm -hmm. Every money, everything I own, I work for myself. I never asked her for money. If she wanted to gift me something, fine, but I never ever asked. And it, and we were, if we had extra money, we were supposed to give that money so that we could help our family back home. And that was mm. so important. And my mother says, I could give you this money, but the, the money, you know, the child uh, benefits that you, you know, she sent that back home because she knew that mm. they needed that money to survive and to eat more than I did in Canada, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you ask my children, I did the same thing when as soon as they were, you know, we were, they were getting child benefit, both children's child benefit, I sent back home and we adopted six children back home in the Philippines and we educated them. And, um, now they're all grown up. They all, they're all like finished school, but you know, some are still mm -hmm. in college and stuff, but most are working now and stuff, but they're, they all lived and, you know, they lived in their home in the Philippines and that's important. You know, that was important. Um, and hopefully they'll do, they will pay it forward. You know, those, mm -hmm. those kids back home, they know how important it is to help each other. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> anyway, that's, that's my story. <laughs> Yeah, uh, um, I mean, um, uh, Milani, thank, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, and uh, I find that when you make a film that's personal to you, that, that you know touches you that much, it comes out in how passionate you are about making it, and then it comes out in the final product. Um, but what are some of the things you actually did like to prepare for the shoots and on the day of the shoot itself? Um, as you know, it's, uh, everything was on zoom. Um, so phase one, uh, was very nerve wracking because, uh, you had a, a lot of people criticizing your work. Um, not criticizing, but critiquing it in a, you know, in a good way, uh, in a constructive way. But because mm. it was so personal, and you can ask Sandrella and people in the phase one of film five, of film five, that I was so emotional. Every single time we spoke about it, I cried. And when other people spoke about their film, I cried. I was like... I was just trying to contain and after the zoom, I would cry because I was feeling so emotional and a lot of memories came back and a lot of stories, mm. uh, Filipino stories, fil of, you know, stories with my mother and my siblings, so much emotion. Mm came back. I actually had to get a spiritual healer, um, to work with me because I, I had to go back. I had to kind of regress and uh, talk about all those emotional things. Otherwise, I don't think I could have moved forward because mm. uh, it was a lot of hurtful things that happened. And I didn't know even if, you know, the film would happen. And then December happened and they said, you got accepted. You know, <laughs> to phase two of the film five program yeah. with AFCU. And, um, you know, you, of course, like before that you had to submit, you had to do your proposal. You had to, like, there was a lot of, a lot of work, like a ton of work and a lot mm. of zoom meetings every weekend, workshops, learning. Uh, I loved every second of it. I really did. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and to prepare for the shoot, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an organizer. If you come to the house, like it's organized chaos, but you know, I have, 
you know, we're, we're self-employed, you know, my husband runs the flooring business. He's also a realtor. You know, I manage his websites, you know, I do his websites. I manage his social media. I do the marketing. I do the staging of the homes. You know, I clean the cottage. Like I'm the maid of the cottage. And, you know, I organize my, my children's life, their fashion, like the things that they do. Um, so mm. I'm kind of like that multitasker and I do a lot of, you know, mental lists. Like as I meditate, I know you're not, you're supposed to let it go, but it's kind of my downtime and I organize like for a month before. Um, mm. and because the Hubbard's community, I work with them, they were so grateful to come back. They gave us, you know, the Anchorage house. Uh, in Hubbard's, you know, we filmed there, but I already had known in the back of my head as I was writing the script where I was going to shoot, who was the person I was going to have as Lena. I had already a network of people before. So before mm. even the script was written, the foundation was already there. So it was very mm. easy for me to ask. I had, you know, I had my savory plate, the catering. I had my Filipino person to cater the subs. Like I already had this knowledge, you know, um, from people mm -hmm. and networking and, and to being involved in the community. So I think that's really important to give back because they give you mm. so much more you know, in return. Mm. And I think that's how the organization for the shoot came about. And of course, I knew uh, Jeremy Chipper, who was our DOP, because his son is dating my daughter. <laughs> 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 and I said, hey, do you want to make a film with me? And he's like, send me the script, you know, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, because he is a TV person, like he does the trailer park boys, you know, this is a new yep. thing for him and he was ready mm. to jump in. And because mm -hmm. his, uh, his uncle is married to a Filipino girl. So he's very, mm -hmm. um, it's very close to home for him, you know, mm. and, um, and also his wife, Tina, um, has a niece who's, you know, from Asia as well. So it's very mm. close to them. They know about the isolation and all that. And they really felt passionate about the script. And I think, you mm. know, and Jeremy brought in all these people he knew, like Nicole Close, who is so dynamic, like that woman. I could not, mm -hmm. seriously, she is just amazing like i want to be her one day <laughs> <laughs> maybe i am a little bit already and that's why i love her so much but maybe. yeah but i mean i was i'm used to you know i do weddings in the summer i organize events uh i organize mm. the fashion shows you know i produce the fashion show so it was not you know, it's like, you know, I've moved 35 times in my life. I've built, you know, we've built Whoa. homes, we've renovated homes. So it's, mm -hmm. it's like building a film. It's, you know, it's exactly mm. the same way. So if you have mm. the organization skills and if you have the help from people, because you cannot make a film by yourself, there's no way. Mm -hmm. You need a community. Mm -hmm. And I was just so lucky to have the community backing me completely so that is awesome yeah. you know what melanie i'm gonna have you come back to this sanctuary because there's so <laughs> many parts we skipped we skipped a lot of parts but but uh um, i want to end with this though now you know you've shot made you're in the post-production process and then when he's ready when you're ready to show the film what do you want people that watch the film to get out of watching made Ah, <sighs> that's a hard question. Um, because I really didn't know how to end the story. Um, but I, what I really wanted for my community, because it is a Filipino film, it's, and in my, it's in my language. So, uh, really it's an ode to my Filipino community, um, for me being Filipino, um, so to, it's, I dedicate it really to them, 
and to my kids mm. um, and to my family in Vancouver and Hawaii, you know, and the Philippines. Really, this film is for me to say, you know, like, thank you. You know, mm. really, that's that's all it is, is to say I wanted to make this film as an artist, you know, as a gift. And if you take away whatever you take away, you know, that's for you because every single human being has had different experiences. And when they watch this, it's going to hit them in a different way. You know, it's going to hit you a different mm. way. I know, Israel, it's going to hit Ian a different way, Sandra a different way. Um, my husband, when he watches this, um, because every single thing in this film happened. It, it's mm. real. It happened in real life. It was experienced by many people in my life. Not just mm. me, but, you know my whole family. Um, so I had a brother who committed suicide. So, you know, it's very, and anyway, <laughs> I, you know, I want, I want them to take away what they want to take away from it, mm. you know? So I don't want to say, Oh, you should take away this because we're all different. We're all coming mm. from different worlds. So I hope, that I could make a film that touched everybody and that maybe they can hug their family a little bit longer. That's it. Wow. Uh, Milani, thank you so much uh, for the time, for taking me on this journey of your life so far. And um, I guess, you know, sharing your vulnerability and, you know, all this emotion. Um, um, and this is why I really started this different show, like, to give people a place to talk about whatever it is they want to talk about and express it in their own way. And it's like, there's no judgment, there's no spin. This is what it is. Pure humanity at its, you know, purest form, I guess. Um, so, so thank you for sharing and thank you for coming to the sanctuary and, um, expect an email from me saying we have to do this again. Uh, especially once you're done with like a rough cut of me for sure. Yes. Thank you so much. Anyway, thank you for having the show because you know, you let me speak my mind and have a voice. Thank you again. <laughs>